guys, it's Karen, and I've got a bit of a different video today, which is how to increase your bond with your dog. I've got eight things listed here, and they are kind of a culmination of the hundreds of books I've read, the magazines that I read all the time, and what I have done and experienced myself. I've tried a lot of these things, done a lot of these things, and found that my bond has increased with Watson. And you may think, well, I don't need to increase my bond, but there's always things you can do to strengthen a bond, to make your dog's life better. This is not just about increasing the bond, strengthening the bond, it is making your dog happier. And so like I said, these are advices from behaviorists, you know, articles written on behaviorists or books written by trainers and behaviorists, etc. And things that I've tried myself and have found have made Watson to be more focused on me on walks, um, more affectionate and, and happier. He seems to enjoy life um, when I do these things. So I know that not everybody will agree with these. So if you are, I, I find there's a lot of people that are very old school on YouTube about dogs that, you know, any video I show, they're like, you shouldn't be letting them tear toys apart. You shouldn't be letting them do this. And they're very like a dog should just be seen and not heard kind of thing. And that's not the attitude that I have. And hopefully if you're watching this video, neither do you. Listen, which way? Should we go that way or that way? Which way you show me? This way? Okay, let's go. So number one is autonomy. And this is a recent article that I read and I've read a couple of things about this, that to make a dog happier, give them some autonomy. Because if you think about it, you decide everything in their life. You decide when they're going for a walk, you decide what they're going to eat, you decide when it's playtime, you decide when it's bedtime, kind, kind of, not always, but you know what I mean, when it's lights out and everybody has to sleep. Um, and so it's nice to give them choices where it is possible. And obviously it needs to fit in with what you're doing. But the way that I implemented this is I give him a choice of treats or dinner or not dinner every day, but when we order from Bella and Duke, I will say take two tubs out. And if it's time for him to change to another recipe, because they're supposed to have different proteins. And so he's got duck, I don't know, he's got three proteins. Anyway, I take two out, open the lids of both of them, offer him one just quickly to get a smell and the other one and then say which one. And I've taught him that with a game that you can play with putting a treat in one hand. I say smell, smell which one and he'll pour the one that's got the treat in. Um, and kind of from that, I've built on that and just I'll give him two options and say which one and he'll pour on nose the one that he wants. Ready? That one or that one, which one? that one okay. and so that's just one way of giving him a little bit of i can't think of any other word other than autonomy you know he's got something that he can choose what he wants to do um the other thing that both kev and i do is that we let him choose which way he's going on a walk and if he wants to sniff but that's still it's still controlled by us to an extent because you know obviously we wouldn't we're not going to walk in the middle of the road we're not going to walk somewhere that's inappropriate um and with Kev, if he's got to get somewhere, or even me, if we've got to get to the vet, then I'm not going to be able to just stop and let him sniff. But I see lots of people dragging their dog along, not letting them sniff. But actually, if you let them sniff along the way and stop when they want to, firstly, they're happier because they're able to decide something for themselves. But also the sniffing in itself will tire them out more than just a walk, you know, just a long march. And you know what? It's really interesting with the treats because what I try to do is give him a choice, talking of the devil, and, and it helps me find out exactly what his taste is. You know, does he prefer duck or pork? Um, does he prefer these streets or those streets? You know, you can get to know them better. Um, and of course that's gonna make them happier, isn't it? Number two is really simple, and this is to sit on the floor. This is something that I do, but again, I struggle with my knees, but I know that this was told to me by a trainer um, to get on their level, especially when they're puppies, or especially if they're small. Just sit on the floor with them, and you might find that they come up and lay on you. Watson is not a cuddly dog, but if I'm sitting on the floor, he will like put his head on my 
leg. He won't jump up on the sofa and do that unless there's treats involved. Um, but if I'm on the floor, it's almost like I'm on his level. Um, and what I found now is that Watson, he doesn't play with toys other than after his walk in the evening. And we have a sort of game of tug normally with old clothes like we, we cut up socks into rings and then thread them through um but he won't play unless either myself or my husband are sitting on the floor it's almost like although he's not always playing with us he might sit and choose something himself we need to be sitting there and he appreciates that and he's like this is our time you sit on the floor with me you're at my level um, and I can just feel how much he enjoys that you know it's really important to him because if I get up and sit on the sofa he'll stop playing and just look at me like what do you think you're doing this is our time, you know, this is our one-on-one -on -one time. And so you get back on the floor and he'll start chewing again. Um, so I would say it's something really easy, but just sit on the floor and get on their level and play with them. You ready? Bang, bang! Clever boy. <laughs> Number three is training and training is kind of known as something that will increase the bond between you and your dog. And it can be anything from impulse training you know just decide that you will help them not run to the door that's something i need to start repeating with watson as um he was just barking when the door went there um training them for a high five training them to give you a paw training them to close and open doors i've done an awful lot of training with watson and he loves those little sessions and it definitely it increases the understanding of each other you get it always gives me a laugh as well so i i'd really highly recommend doing some training but as long as you've got patience you know you can't get impatient with dogs um, but it's definitely something that increases the bond and that is a kind of known method if you want your dog to listen to you more do some training especially if you're doing like clicker training and giving them treats they will be delighted to do things that you ask them to do because they you've formed that bond of i teach you something and you get a reward to mum <laughs> to mum you can take another one then. Come on. <laughs> Good boy. Where should we go for a walk today? What do you fancy? You want to go to Arthur's seat? I know you like it out there. But it's quite a hot day, so we might be better going somewhere with a river. So you can get nice and cool. What do you think? Number four is a bit of an odd one, um, but, and I, I read this in an article, it was to talk to your dog and Kev and I discussed it and we both talked to him and I think a lot of people do. But I think it's also important to not, to just sit with them in silence sometimes as well. So I suppose I'm telling you two things, talk to them sometimes, but not always. Like I'm a chatty person and I don't think Watson would appreciate it if when he was sleeping, I was sitting talking to him. You know, if I want to sit with him when he's sleeping, I need to remember to be quiet because I can be that person that goes in and is like, oh, I love you so much. Do you know how much I love you? And he's kind of, his eyebrows are moving and he's like, what? I'm just trying to sleep here, you know? Um, whereas if he's, if he's awake and with me, there's no harm in me chatting to him, you know, because I feel like that makes him feel like we're together. You know, the two of us are together. He doesn't understand a word I'm saying, but we can chat. <laughs> um, and like I said, that was reinforced when I read that article that dogs some dogs like it more than others because you can actually read them read to them and some dogs like that i have tried that with watson and he just walks away so i don't think he likes that i bought a little book and i tried to read the book to him and he just wasn't interested but some dogs do like that they'll find it soothing you know he might prefer it with my husband's voice actually because my voice is very loud and high energy um maybe even anxious and so my husband is a much more stable person with a, a gentler voice so we might actually enjoy it more from my husband okay number five is to watch their body language and i can be very unobservant sometimes so what i've tried to do with watson is i've tried to choose a body part a day so i might say this week i'm just going to watch his tail and see what his tail does then the next week i'm just going to watch his ears and see what his ears do then I'm going to watch his body and see which position it's in. And you can learn so much from that. I think that's how I discovered our little thing that I do this, which looks kind of rude, but it's scratchy scratch is what I say to him. And like I said, Watson has never been a cuddly dog, but I started thinking, I wonder if he'd be more interested if he was getting a scratch. Um, and he's always been like, he'll, if you walk past him, he'll put his little thigh out. He likes his <laughs> thigh scratch. But apart from that, didn't seem to be that bothered about it. But I started saying to him, 
do you want a scratchy scratch? And then I would give him a little scratch and I'd scratch like under his arms. And slowly but surely, I saw reactions in him. And so I'd say, do you want a scratchy scratch? And it was this one time he was lying down and I said, do you want a scratchy scratch? And he stood up, came running over to me with his tail wagging and sat down. And I had seen the sort of gradual him getting to that place by observing his body language and so clearly this was something he loved and no he wasn't going to be a cuddler but he would come and like flop right on you as long as you were giving him a little scratch on his chest or under his arms you know so I think it's really interesting and you can get to know them so well from their body language that you can see well, exactly where do they like to be scratched do they like it when you scratch behind their ear or in front of their ear or under their chin or you know on their forehead or whatever um, you can learn a lot about them. There's my Watson just being such a good boy. So quiet. What a good boy. Number six is really important and I don't think many people do this. Tell me if you do, um, which is praise them or treat them when they're quiet. We were told this early on actually, so we have done this, um, but it's still something that we forget. Because sometimes Kev will say to me, why did you just give him a treat for? Because he was just sitting in the window and we hadn't heard a peep from him that's why I'm giving him a treat you just you tend to ignore them when they're not doing anything bad when they are just sitting quietly you tend to ignore them and so he was just sitting in the window he wasn't actually sleeping I could see he was just looking about really quietly and so I just got a treat went over and I said you're a good boy for being quiet and gave him a treat um, and like I said this is something a natural trainer that we had told us that a lot of people forget to do that you know you'll do a training session with him or you'll try and work on a behavior but you don't reward them when they're being good um, and so if you have learned recall with your dog don't forget to treat them now and then you know even if you're at the stage where they come back all the time still occasionally give them a treat and remind them how much you appreciate them coming back or doing what you want them to do you know um, so praise when quiet number seven Number seven um, is make enrichment toys yourself. Number seven and eight are really about you being, getting more hands on. So make enrichment toys with your own hands, be that putting treats in boxes, putting treats around the house for them to find. Um, they will love these games, but if you've made something with your own hands or that smells of you, they will love it even more. So any old clothes that we have, like old pajamas or old socks, we cut up. Now you have to make sure you cut them up so they don't look like clothes. So with socks, we cut the, the toe off and that gets thrown away, as does the top band cut it into circles and thread it through into a chain. He absolutely loves that. And I can tell you that I've got, I will have, you know, take my socks off and put them on the floor and he doesn't run away with them. Now, if you've got a totally sock orientated dog anyway, that might encourage it. I don't know if dogs would be able to tell from the smell or oh, that's a pair of socks and therefore be more attracted to socks. So if you've got a dog that likes clothes or socks, this might not be one for you. Stick to like cardboard boxes if they're not somebody that ingests things. But anything that you do with your hands or anything that smells with you is going to increase the bond between you. The final one, number eight, maybe only applies to dogs with longer hair, but it's to groom them yourself um, if you at all can. So learn to do their, even if it's just cutting their toenails, learn to do it yourself. Even if I know that it's very nerve wracking cutting dogs toenails because they can bleed. And so the way that I got around that with Watson was take off the tiniest amount until you start feeling confident um but i say this because again people will disagree and say i oh, know it's much better for them to go to a stranger because the stranger knows what they're doing and the stranger won't be anxious and obviously if you are going to be too anxious then maybe you should just still send them to the groomers but i feel like grooming watson myself i do his whole groom obviously um but I have trained to be a groomer, so it's a little bit different. But whatever you can do, whether it's brushing, whether it's tidying up their face, whether it's cutting their toenails, 
who's going to take more care of them than their owner and even though they might not know it it will be a much more pleasurable experience for them having it done by somebody they know in a place they know by somebody they know and trust than being with a stranger and already probably being stressed by dogs barking around them by having to sit in a crate before and after etc etc if you do have a long-haired dog and you do want to do the full groom yourself then of course that will save you money um, and for those of you that don't know i do have a DIY grooming course, um, how to groom your dog at home using my Watson. I have groomed every area of him and also do talks, etc., um, explaining what equipment you need, what scissors you need, how to do it, etc. So I'll link that for you in case you're interested. So that's everything. I hope that that was interesting to you. If you have got any tips on how to bond with your dog, then please leave them below so yeah let me know what you do to to increase your bond or to make your dog happy and let me know how you get on if you try any of these and i'll speak to you again soon